It's a great pleasure to introduce Lila Williamson. Um, uh, Lila is currently writing her PhD at the University of Ghent uh, uh, as part of the project coming after the eco politics of late antiquity, working with um, uh, Marco Formisano. It's a really exciting project they've got uh, lined up. And um, uh, great, great to be getting a first glimpse of that today. Um, uh, um, so uh, Lila studied in, uh, studied in Sydney and in, in Oxford. Um, has a very wide expertise in late antique Latin poetry, among other things, particularly uh, is working on treatments of journeys, landscapes, bodies, things, and temporality. Um, and it's great to have you here, Lila. Thank you very much. So let me show you the strawberry tree, or the arbutus in, in Latin. In lots of uh, Augustan-era poetry, it's associated with the simple pleasures of rural life, maybe, you know, inspiring this Pompeian fresco here, perhaps. It's still present around the Mediterranean today, uh, all over the Mediterranean, Ireland as well, apparently. It's actually Italy's national tree, Corbezzolo. Uh, its fruit is used in jams and liqueurs and traditional medicine. From an ecological perspective, it's very hardy and fire resistant. Apparently it has a really good root system. Uh, which makes it an excellent pioneer tree for your next reforestation project. Uh, extra fun fact, it's also Joni Mitchell's favourite tree. She <laughs> says that <laughs> she loves its rebellious nature and it's at the end of uh, one of her songs. So I'm saying uh, all of this uh, so that when I turn to the motif of this tree in the ancient Latin poetry, I can have in mind it's very real fruit and leaves and wood that we can still see and, and engage with today, uh, recognizing that it's the same tree, continuous in a way from then to now, for me has this uh, effect of making me realize and keep in mind how different actually today's world is from these ancient Latin poets when you think it's the same tree but these are very different people thinking about the same well yeah the same tree and this this kind of effect uh, is also relevant because the idea of living in a changed world is actually the key theme that links together the text that I will discuss today and the idea of living in a changed world is particularly relevant as we together reflect on what it means to live in our Anthropocene times, which are, of course, marked by the sense of living in this fundamentally irrevocably changed world. So that's the framework that I'm coming from. And in particular, I want to explore the Anthropocene affect uh, feeling of solastalgia. Um, yes, uh, which is particularly relevant uh, as the world experiences the effects of climate change in an increasingly localized kind of real time effect. Um, uh, it's coined by the Australian psychologist Glenn Albrecht, 2005, and it refers to the pain experienced when the place where one resides and that one lives is under immediate physical assault. So it's the form of homesickness that you get when you're still at home because your immediate environment that you're attached to is changing or has been so violently assaulted and a lot of people experience this in the you know increasing natural disasters around the world i'm from australia i think about the experience of driving through these like drought ravaged farmscapes uh where you know the color of the ground is really different or driving through a forest that's totally carbonized you know skeletons after a bushfire so this uh yeah this is the feeling um that is uh, particularly Anthropocene affect, but I, I kind of want to use it as a lens to also look at what it means to live in a changed world in these uh, ancient poems. Uh, as a disclaimer, I'm taking a slightly broader understanding of the phenomenon. Um, I think for for uh, our friend Glenn here, it's, it's a very localized phenomenon like your specific place, but I'm being a little bit broad just to get in there in case someone notices that, um, yeah. So that's what I want to look at, the experiences of living in a changed world, because we are here, but here is not the same as it once was. The three texts I want to look at today 
uh, from very, very different times, actually. So it's a nice overview of different stages of Latin poetry. I'm going to look at the end of the Golden Age, as described in Virgil's Georgics. I'm going to look at Rutilius Martianus's journey home in De Redditu Suo. And also this little gem here, it's a wedding poem, Epithalamium, um, by Anonius in the 6th century. So first, let's turn to Virgil's Georgics. Uh, to the end of the Golden Age and the beginning of the Iron Age. Uh, Iron Age is a time of labour, suffering, agriculture, war, and there's been a lot of ink spilled on Virgil and his Golden Ages, Iron Ages. Today, uh, I want to take a particular view and read the transition to the Iron Age as analogous perhaps to <coughs> Anthropocene era climate change. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, oh, this is work in progress. I'd love to hear your feedback. <laughs> Um, whether you think this works. So here's the Georgic's description of the peaceful pre-agricultural world. Before Jupiter, that is before the Iron Age, no farmers subjugated the fields. The earth herself produced everything freely with no one demanding it of her. Ceres first taught mortals to plough the earth with iron, that's agriculture, when at that time the oaks and strawberry trees of the sacred wood were failing and Dodona refused them nourishment. So the strawberry tree, it's still present for the audiences of Virgil, but it's, it's harkening back to a time before the strawberry trees were different, before they provided much more abundant fruit. It's only now we live in a changed world, the fruit's not quite enough to sustain mortals without the violence of agriculture. And the violence of agriculture is, of course, you can see that in the subjugabant, like subjugating the fields. It's like this military conquest of the fields um, just to survive with agriculture. So that's the description of, yeah, the, the golden age and moving into the introduction of agriculture. And the strawberry tree is not only a reminder of the past abundance of the golden age, it's actually also part of the Iron Age world, which is in the next passage. It must also be said what the weapons, the armour of the hard rustics are. And then there's a list of agricultural tools, including at the end there, the strawberry tree harrows and the mystic fan of Yacus. And I think it's particularly interesting how the very same tree that once provided such abundant fruit in today's world is now hacked down and becomes part of the farmer's armoury, his armour. And that encapsulates the story that the violence of this contemporary Iron Age, to be a bit acronistic perhaps, was not always the case. In the past, fruit was abundant and generous, but now the wood is cut down, like violently, to make tools for agriculture, which in turn per perpetuates this violent, yet unfortunately it seems necessary, mastery of the land. So it's a totally changed way of humans and these trees like their relationship. And the fruit of the strawberry tree was available and familiar to the audiences. Um, and I think that its links with the Golden Age imaginary, not just in Virgil, but you know, like Ovid, Lucretius also have the same tree in their Golden Age, uh, Golden Age passages. I think it suggests that the fruit has the potential to like tell this story looking back to a time of more abundance, more non-violence in relation to the earth. And I think we can see strong resonances with the world that we are living in today as well in this uh, Anthropocene predicament. Agriculture, particularly in its contemporary industrial form, has totally altered ecosystems around the world, often highly destructive ways. Yet, of course, we rely on agriculture to eat and survive. Uh, and it's not just agriculture in terms of getting resources from the earth. Also, more broadly, global reliance on fossil fuels, which is actually also from trees, interesting, anyway. Global reliance on fossil fuels has entangled us in this paradox where we are like hacking into the earth to extract resources to sustain life, but then the life pattern that we're living is in turn contributing to the destruction of the earth, which is going to be harmful to us in the end. So what we use to live is doing violence to the earth and ultimately to humans 
of course, as well. And I think that the Arbutus tree in the Golden Age, Iron Age passages here in Virgil can be read as a kind of icon embodying this conflict. It's, it's the witness in its continuity um, to this changed world and how we've come to rely on violence for human survival. So that's the first strawberry tree. And it's not exactly soul nostalgia because soul nostalgia is more about your personal connection with your home where you're in and you feel that it's changed in your lifetime. Uh, Virgil is more kind of, hard, it's, it's a, there's a distance there because he's thinking back to like mythology, this kind of prehistorical time. But our next strawberry tree is much more closely, has that personal um, link. And that's from Rutilius. So uh, Rutilius was a 5th century Gallo-Roman government official and poet. He's writing this poem in 417, which is seven years after the sack of Rome. And his poem charts his journey home from Rome to the Gallic countryside where he's from, which has been ravaged by invasion. But so his home has totally changed. And as he pictures his home, he doesn't quite know what's waiting in store for him as he leaves Rome. And I'll uh, read the poet passage so we can be immersed a little bit. So, fate snatches me away from these beloved shores that is Rome. The fields of Gaul are calling for their son. Those fields as lovely once as now they're pitiful are ravaged and deformed by these long wars. When times are good, ignoring, ho ignoring home's not such a crime. But now, shared losses call back native sons. The family home requires our tearful presence now. Often grief can tell how best to serve. Ignoring such disasters uh, further is not right. Delaying aid will only make them worse. Great fires have ravaged these proud plantations. Now it's time to start from scratch, rebuilding humble huts. And if my native springs themselves could utter words, if our strawberry trees themselves could speak aloud, they'd pick me up and scold me, fill my sails, and end my homesickness by sending me back home. Conquered, I go home. The journey home so late is hard to bear. So once again, we have a poem reflecting on a changed world. As he imagines his native land, he actually doesn't name a specific place. It's just the general um, Gallica Rua. And he can't even picture a specific form. They're dephobia, they're chaotic, maybe in opposition to this, you know, civilizational ordering force of Rome. <coughs> and they're spatially incoherent, also temporally. It's long last ruinas, they're long ruins. And his return journey home is already late. So there's this anxious sense of being too late, time being out of joint. He, he, the, the feeling that we get here is this really anxious grief, and that's, what is spurring the labor, where's the labor? The um, labor of rebuilding, um, where is it? Yeah, um, line 26 there. Uh, and even this rebuild, rebuilding um, is, uh, yes, um, just these, these huts as well, not some kind of, um, uh, colonial expansion of Rome, but these simple rustic huts in the post-fire ruins, that's that's what he imagines um, he's going to have to encounter. So this sense of having to go home but, but not really feeling at home there, I think that's an intensely nostalgic Anthropocene effect, the uncertain sense of where home is and what, what home is. And in terms of our strawberry trees, uh, we've got them... Uh, the our strawberry trees, so he feels a connection to them, even though he hates leaving Rome. Um, Nostra Abuta. Uh, and perhaps he chooses Abuta specifically because of their association with, you know, like the simplicities of rustic life. Maybe that's why he chooses these trees specifically. But actually, the trees don't actually speak here. It's expressed in a hypothetical. It's saying if they could speak, but they can't actually speak. He has to fill in the gaps. He has to imagine what they're going to say. He, he can't actually understand them. They can't actually communicate with him. It's a crap, it's um, ruptured communication between the like human, cultural, urban that Rutilius represents and then the non-human, rural, natural 
that the tree represents, this dichotomy has become violently uh, evident. And that's part of the sense of anxious grief that he feels, this sense of ruptured sense of self, ruptured sense of place. And that's what the term nostalgia, I think, so aptly captures, because in today's world, there's so much art and literature and films and people wanting to return to some kind of imagined past or maybe even from their childhood and somehow there was more harmony, there was more connection, you know, in, in our childhood or something like that. But there's also increasingly this grim sense that the return's ultimately impossible, that it's idealistic, that it's romanticised. Where is this like pre-Anthropocene home that we can find ourselves in, that we can get to? As Rutilius writes, the journey home so late is hard to bear. And that really speaks into the Anthropocene condition, I think. So two kind of depressing <laughs> views of what it means to live in a changed world. Uh, we have uh, the violence of agriculture, and then we have this impossibility of return, um, an impossibility to, of the trees to speak anything meaningful anymore. So uh, I have one more poem, um, which is perhaps more optimistic. This part's still a bit work in progress, so I would, I would really like your feedback to see if my reading of the next poem works at all. It's from Anodius, who is sixth century uh, poet, rhetorician, but he had a really successful ecclesiastical career. So his, his job was in the church as deacon, uh, bishop. And this poem is a wedding poem for his friend, uh, Maximus, one of the aristocracy. Yeah. And one of the reasons I chose this passage as well is that the uh, strawberry tree passages from Virgil and Rutilius are all about the tree's relationship with the human. Um, but here, there's actually no humans to be seen in the opening of the poem. Of course, after this, it goes on to talk about Maximus and his wedding and everything. But at the beginning, like, we're invited into this world where we don't really see humans centered at all. Instead, it's the lush and fertile generativity of spring that's taking center stage. So let me read this and you can see how vibrant it is. The year it's sun renewed forms tender stalks of grain. The ground warms. Nature in her chamber sits. The world is painted with great varieties of flower buds. Lands have a single face. Care, love, goodwill, or have you want to translate, gratia cultus amo. The fruit of the wild strawberry trees gains strength from their life-giving warmth. Their sap grows thick and fosters woody seed. The earth becomes aroused in full fertility to message trees, leaf, frisky foliage. Great translation from Mulligan there. Milky grass is pressed down into knotty turf. Jeweled fingers start to burgeon from the branch. In nature's image, marriage law joins wedding torch. And sky's breath, that's the pollen. Pollen, we had that before. Sky's breath, the pollen, like a spouse, conceives all things. Therefore, with shared desire, the sun, sky, river, Nereus, wild creatures, mountains, meadows, all bring forth joys. I said there's no human actors in these lines, and that's true, but you will have noticed that lots of the language used to describe the vibrancy of this non-human world can also, of course, be used of humans and human sexuality and marriage. For example, nature is described as sitting in Talamis, like in her bridal chamber. Um, the gratia cultus amor, they're all arguably human cultural traits, qualities. The um, and when we had our strawberry tree growing thick and hard with sap and seed, that's obviously a pretty phallic image as well, relating to human sexuality. Um, same with the earth and trees being aroused more generally, a lot of this lexicon can be used for human sexuality. Uh, and it's the law of marriage, the lex, that is bringing everything together. The sky is like a spouse, or sponsum, and that's what allows everything to be conceived. So you could say, yes, there's no human actors, but really, obviously, you could say this is actually really about the consummation of human marriage. It's just anthropomorphizing the non-human. It's, it's a metaphor. 
And that would make sense because Enodius, remember, he's in the church, so this is like a safe way for him to celebrate the consummation of marriage by displacing the erotic lexicon onto spring because this, we're talking at a time where Christian asceticism is highly valued and that's how people can read this. Um, so, yeah, it's a safe way to do that. Can I do this? Yes. Okay. Perhaps. And I, I, of course, that reading is there. I don't want to discard it. However, maybe we can take, uh, we can take this with another reading as well. Maybe there's a little wilder undercurrent to try and resist that immediate anthropocentric impulse to interpret the passage. And one of the ways to do that is to look at the, this is amazing centerpiece of the poem. It's a conversation between Cupid and Venus, where Cupid complains to his mother Venus about this emerging trend for asceticism. Consuming passionless virginity subdues the limbs of many. Uh, these sublime and novel desires defeat the flesh. The order stands, its voice is weak. He's concerned that uh, asceticism is it's new and it's threatening the generative rhythms of the nature culture continuum, the mundus, the cosmos, the order of things as a whole. We're like messing with the way that things should be, uh, uh, Cupid is saying. So, yeah, it's so interesting. But Venus doesn't share his worries. She's not bothered at all. She replies a little tongue-in-cheek that after rest, this greater flame will teach all that a goddess grows who not lies neglected. So she's not worried at all. And Maximus's celibacy is less a virtue to be celebrated and more a minor interruption in these inevitable rhythms of desire and generativity that characterize the whole more than human mundus or cosmos um, as a whole. So Anodius is, yeah, he's kind of safely couching it, this kind of tongue-in-cheek idea in these pagan deities rather than voicing it himself. Um, but I think especially paired with the opening of the poem, uh, which is vibrantly generative, more than human, it's unaffected by human attempts at asceticism, I think that invites us to, to see this world that's much bigger than uh, just the um, yeah impulse for uh, asceticism and uh, celibacy. I think that reading the natural world as a metaphor implies that it's distinct from the human world, right? Because a metaphor implies these two things are distinct. Instead, we can also read it as contiguous instead. So instead of the natural, the natural world being a metaphor for the human world, it's all on this, in the same contiguity. And in the prologue, we saw um, at the end here, this list of uh, sun, sky, river, Nereus, it's the ocean, the animals, the mountains, the meadows, everything together, this list um, does not, uh, so all kinds of beings and ecosystems are in this, are in this rhythm. And by implication, this, I think this also includes a human who's not centered, but rather participates in this wider, more than human ecology. So how does this then link back to taking a view from the Anthropocene? How does that link at all? <coughs> the opening lines, these ones here, invite us to have a more than human imaginary for the way that rhythms of life work and to experiment how we see and represent the rhythms of creativity, desire and pleasure while avoiding a purely anthropocentric standpoint as much as we can as humans. Cupid's complaint that humans have been severed from the natural rhythms of life can also resonate with today where there's a sense that humans have been severed from the, you know, natural connection with life, perhaps, from more sustainable, life-nourishing patterns of living. In both cases, for Cupid and for people today, there's a sense that the world has changed, that humans are not living as they once did, and that this is harmful. But the words of Venus and then this opening of the poem suggests that by no means is everything totally lost. 
In fact, despairing that humans have lost connection with nature presumes that the two spheres can be separated because another perspective would recognize that human rhythms are always ultimately contiguous with the wider more than human world that is continuing to find ways to live and thrive. And of course, human attempts to separate the two have been destructive. So the reminder of this ultimate contiguity, I think is a much needed perspective that we can think with and play with as we think about what it means to live in a changed and changing world. Maybe we can step back a bit and think not just from the purely human perspective. Uh, as, as difficult as it is in the midst of this, you know, worsening environmental crisis, how can humans be attuned to the ways that we are already and always part of this much wider, more than human world? So I would love to hear what you think, if it's a bit of a stretch or not, but yes. So three very different poems. Um, I'll just put them all together. Uh, all about the anxiety of living in a changed world, Iron Age, destruction of Gaul, Cupid's worry that humans are disconnected from nature. I would love to hear your thoughts on what it means to, or whether I can read like this, <laughs> whether I can read from the Anthropocene in this way. Am I being too anachronistic? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, or if there are other ways, or if you think that this can be a productive and interesting way to read pre-modern texts. And I think it is productive and interesting, so would love to hear your thoughts. Yes. <laughs> 